Seattle U head basketball coach Chris Victor joins the show today to tell you all why this Red Hawks program is a great addition to the West Coast Conference. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Happy Wednesday and welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Well, Seattle U head coach Chris Victor will join us today to discuss the program's move to the WCC, the team's win in the CBI last season, navigating the transfer portal, scheduling stuff, what he's most excited about with joining the WCC, all that coming up here on today's episode of Locked on Zags. Well, I am thrilled to be joined today by Coach Chris Victor, the head coach at Seattle University, coming off a third straight season of 20 or more wins and a CBI championship, now preparing to be a full-time member of the WCC starting in July of 2025. Coach, I know that it has been a long, long time coming for Seattle U. Most of the listeners to the show know this. I used to work at Seattle U. I was a grad student there about 10 years ago. I know how much the WCC has been the number one goal for this university for a very long time. What was your reaction to finding out that the votes were coming through, that this was going to happen, that everything was getting finalized for 2025 to be the year that this university finally joins the WCC? Yeah, it's really exciting for I mean, not just our basketball program or athletic department, but for you're right for the whole university. Um, you know, it's been a long road for Seattle U. You know, going, going dropping Division One sports down to the NAIA, building back up to Division Two, getting back to Division One. This has always been something where I think from the top down, um, getting back to the WCC was always part of the vision of where this university and where the de- the department was going to head. So to hear it, all all of the work that so many people have put in. Um, not just the current staff or the current AD or the current president. Obviously, they had a big role in this and um, huge, you know, huge thanks to them. But everyone that's been involved with Seattle U for, for so long. So to have that day where, where you know, we were voted in and um, it, it made it officials, it was, it was really exciting for everyone involved. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, you, 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 you drop down, you have 30, 40 years of basically getting back to that level where you finally reach that that upper echelon, you're back in Division One, And again, as somebody who was there at the time and did some of the academic support, like getting the rest of the university on board with understanding what being a Division One school meant and what that meant from a travel perspective and and all of those various things was was a, a challenge and a, a multi-year process of, of figuring out what can we do to get to this level and you look at the schools in the WCC I mean every West Coast city is is now represented in this conference with a a similar institutional institution university like Seattle U and, and San Diego and San Francisco and LMU and Portland like it kind of felt like this was the direction where we needed to get Seattle U back in this conference because it just felt like that's where they belonged and now you get that opportunity uh, it's this it's the the right fit institutionally and from a basketball perspective you know we're looking at a team that like I said three straight 20 win seasons how important now in terms of like your your program's ability to recruit and you know generate interest from the the local community and the donor base and everything like that how much do you think and i know obviously it hasn't happened yet but how much do you think that will help this basketball program which is already on this upward trajectory continue to grow now that you're joining a conference with teams like gonzaga and saint mary's and san francisco and santa clara and these kind of programs that have had a, a lot of recent basketball success yeah, completely agree. It's such a natural fit for a university and for the conference. And, um, you know, it's some it's some that we've like we talked about before, it's always kind of been a vision of the university and, and the department. And, um, you know, for for the last th- three years for the men's basketball program, since I've been the head coach, we've seen a lot of growth. You know, mm-hmm. we've taken some big steps and have have had success at CLU that we haven't seen in over 70 years since El- Elgin Baylor was playing here back in the 50s. Mm-hmm. So. We, the program's going in the right direction and really proud of the success we've had and the jumps we've made. And um, and now we're leveling, leveling up conferences, too. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that growth needs to continue and needs to be accelerated a little bit. And we understand um, being in the WCC will help a lot. It will help us recruit a, a higher level athlete, um, a lot of talent in Seattle uh, mm-hmm. in the high school basketball scene. It's, it's in a 
amazing basketball environment here. And, um, you know, keeping some of those guys home now to play in the WCC, I think will be a little more enticing. And um, I think we'll have a lot of excitement with our donor base, with our alumni who've been kind of been wanting this too for a while. So um, as our program's grow growing, uh, I think the timing's, the timing's perfect for us to, to, to keep developing and keep getting to the next level. And, and moving conferences up to WCC is going to help that. When you look at the teams that are going to be in your conference, obviously the, the traditional WCC opponents, and then for at least one year, you'll get that Oregon State, Washington State uh, opponents as well. Uh, what, what, what teams or, or coaches or venues are you kind of most excited to get the opportunity to have as a part of your conference uh, going forward starting, starting in 2025? Yeah, I mean, I grew up in the Bay Area, so Grew up in the San Francisco area, so very familiar. Been you know been a West Coast guy my whole life. Spent time in San Francisco. Spent time in Southern California. Uh, spent time in in Spokane when I was coaching at Eastern. So I'm very familiar with with a lot of the coaches. Um, very familiar with um, the cities and the universities. So there's a lot we're excited about. Um, and we're also coming with Grand Canyon, who's a pretty fun place to play too. Pretty fun venue to be at. So um, you know, obviously there's a top, and I I'm been good friends with Randy Bennett for a while. I know mm -hmm. what they've been doing over there. Um, haven't haven't had the pleasure of, of playing on campus at Gonzaga yet, so that'll be mm -hmm. obviously be a fun experience for everyone involved. Um, and then having those teams come to Seattle is going to be huge for us too. You know, um, having the teams in WCC that our fan base and alumni are so excited to see play against the Red Hawks in Seattle uh, will be awesome. So there's so many big time programs and coaches and, and universities in this conference. Um, and there's so many different storylines behind it with the, with the history um, that Seattle U has. So, um, yeah, there'll be a, a lot to look forward to uh, that first year in conference. When you look towards those uh, those teams that are going to come up to Seattle when, when it's Gonzaga, when it's St. Mary's, uh, and this is probably not anything that is remotely finalized at this point, but is the intention to have those games played at, at Climate Pledge Arena? Are you going to have games on campus? Like, do you guys, have you guys kind of finalized what that's going to look like in terms of, of where some of those those marquee games are going to take place? Yeah, we would love to play as many games as we can at Climate Pledge. Um, you know, when you talk about the, it's the best arena in the country, in my mm -hmm. eyes, we put $1.3 billion three years yeah. ago, and um, it's a beautiful facility and an amazing venue. And I know the Zags have played there a couple times mm -hmm. already, so they're familiar with that place as well. And for those games, we love to play it at CPA. Um, and I think we don't have anything finalized yet, mm -hmm. um, but when the schedule comes out and we see dates, we'll, we'll see what we can do to make all that happen. You mentioned coming into the conference with Grand Canyon. I want to talk about them a little bit. Another team that has had a tremendous amount of success in the last four or five years uh, under coach Bryce Drew, 94 wins, I believe, in his tenure. Cup, uh, three out of the last four NCAA tournament appearances. Uh, obviously, they've played WCC teams in two of the last tournaments. They played Gonzaga yeah. two years ago, played St. Mary's. Last year, picked up a W against St. Mary's in Spokane. I know a lot of, a lot of locals were quite happy to see St. Mary's lose in Spokane in that game, but uh, a program that's obviously very different institutionally than a lot of the schools in the WCC, but certainly, uh, at least from a men's basketball perspective, I know they're also very successful in, in baseball and, and many other sports as well. Uh, just feels like that's a, a really big boost to the athletic just kind of makeup of the entire conference. And certainly now coming into the WCC, they feel like a school that is going to really, I think, challenge some of those those programs at the top of this conference uh, with the amount of resources that they have uh, and the success that we've seen from them in the last couple of years. You guys were one of the teams that took them down last year. Uh, what, what, what kind of do you make of this, this Grand Canyon team and this program and the trajectory that they're on right now? Yeah, I think this, this past year, especially they show what they're capable of. Um, you know, beating a very, very good St. Mary's team in the first mm -hmm. round and then giving Alabama everything that they could handle, a Final Four team in the second round. So you're, you're getting a, a high-level basketball program. And you mentioned um, with elite resources, too. Mm -hmm. um, Coach Drew's done an unbelievable job since he started. And I don't think, you know, that they're, they're, their plan is to keep growing as well. So, um, you know, we've, we've been up against them a lot. We, you know, we, we, we got them a couple times in conference the last few years and, you um, you know, had really we lost to them both times in our conference tournament, two cl very close games. So we're very familiar uh, with GCU and the battles that we've had. And um, yeah, but you're getting a heck of a program. Um, and, you know, last year was showing what they're capable of winning the game. And, in, in you know, very familiar to you guys in WCC also mm -hmm. being in St. Mary's, like you mentioned, and playing Gonzaga the year before, but capable of doing some big things. And I think um, anytime you add teams to a conference, you want to 
you want it to be at, to help that elevate, you know, to bring it to the next level. Mm-hmm. And I think adding us where we're going in GCU is going to be a big benefit to the conference on the basketball side. Well, Coach Victor and I are going to come back and discuss how he would sell the program to those skeptical WCC or Gonzaga fans who are maybe not quite sure how to feel about this program yet. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about the team winning the CBI last season, what that means for the Red Hawks. All that coming up in just a second. Right after I tell you that today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors, passion, drive, patience. Folks, that's what brings home the winning trophy, and it's also what helps keep your ride or die alive. And eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers to roof racks, exhaust kits to LED headlights and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you will always find exactly what you're looking for. Plus, with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or you get your money back because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that W. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, and eBay's guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. What would be your message to to Gonzaga fans or WCC fans or, or college basketball fans who who frankly are probably learning about Seattle U for the for the first time here or haven't heard much about them? Uh, what would you say to those fans about the trajectory this program is on and, and and reasons for them to be excited about this team joining the WCC? Because I have made it very clear in the last couple of episodes how excited I am. Obviously, as an alum, there's maybe a bit of bias there, but there to me is very clear reasons why this program is going to be a boost for the WCC. They're going to bring some excitement and some intrigue into the conference. And I'd love to hear kind of your pitch to those to those who maybe are a bit skeptical or just haven't learned a lot about this program of, of why this is an exciting time for the WCC to bring this Seattle U program into the mix. Yeah, understood. I mean, we mentioned not, not being Division One for that long, you know, relative uh, to the rest of the college basketball landscape. And our success has been relatively recent. Um, you know, this year we finished a net ranking of 107, which I think if, you know, throw that in the mix of WCC, I think mm-hmm. we finished right behind San Francisco. So yeah. right in fifth place. So it's the success that we've had and we, that we've been building 66 wins um, in the last three years. Um, but, you know, Seattle U isn't a name that's heard much nationwide or even on the West Coast. You know, mm-hmm. um, the WAC has been one of the best mid-major conferences yeah. for the last few years. But not many people also are aware of of um, the level of basketball played in the WAC. So. Mm-hmm. What I would say is you're getting a program that's had a lot of success. And if you look at the rankings and our 107 net ranking, it's been getting better for the last three years and continuing to grow. Um, you know, adding the city of Seattle uh, to the WCC, I think, is in the, such a you know, great university of Seattle. You, mm-hmm. you put all, the whole package together and you're getting an upcoming program um, in a great university in a beautiful city on the West Coast that wasn't represented before in the WCC. So. I think we have a lot to add. Incredibly well said. And speaking of last year's team, we're we're talking about a 23-win team last year that ties the modern record, which was set two years ago in your first year as the head coach of the program, kind of proving that point of of the recent success has been the most success we've seen, at least since this team has been back at that D1 level. This team also went ahead and, and won the CBI last year, ran through a handful of quality mid-major programs to take home a W, take home a trophy from that CBI tournament. Uh, What, how big was it for you as a coach to see that team, especially in this era where when the season ends, like the transfer portals open immediately and you, and you just kind of see a lot of roster movement right away for you and your team to be able to, to stick together and, and go out and win a, a pretty important or a pretty well-known postseason tournament. Like what, what did that do for the momentum of the program for, for you as a coach? And just to see, especially some of these guys who, who've been in the program for a couple of years who are unfortunately out the door after this, like Cam Tyson and Alex Schumacher, like to, to get those guys out of here with a championship W, what did that mean to, to you and to the program? Yeah, that was the whole reason we did it. You know, we lost a tough game in Vegas to Grand Canyon to, mm-hmm. you know, end our NCAA tournament chances. And at that point, you know, when you talk about a whole season of, of your goal going back to the NCAA tournament, mm-hmm. um, when the loss is fresh, it's, t- it's tough to think about anything else. It's tough yeah. to think about still opportunities to play. But when I asked the seniors first and eventually the whole team, 
if they still wanted to go on, you know, getting invited to the CBI, we have a chance to keep playing and, and end our season on a win, which is very rare and get a championship. Um, it was unanimous. They all wanted to keep going. They all wanted to still play together. And I think that speaks a lot for, for who we had in our locker room. Uh, these guys love playing with each other, love competing with each other. So once I heard that um, and how confident they were that they wanted to go win a championship to finish their career, I was all in. Mm -hmm. uh, and those guys, I mean, they, they had such a good run back there. It was because, you know, those tournaments can go, they can go two ways. You can, you can jump into a CBI and unfortunately mm -hmm. go fly out to Florida from Seattle and lose the first round and fly yeah. back home. And people are asking you, why, you know, why did you, why did you guys go do that? But mm -hmm. um, these guys showed that they were serious. And from day one, um, the way we practiced, um, their focus back there, let us go on a run. And there's some, there's, there's nothing like finishing your season with the championship. Um, and to have that experience for our seniors, like you mentioned, and to throw Shea Riley in there too, mm -hmm. guy that was with us for two years, had a really big impact on that. Just, just happy for those guys. I mean, Cam Tyson, the three years that he spent at Seattle was a huge reason that we're sitting having this conversation now. I mean, he elevated our program to this level. Um, and I'm glad that he was able to go out and win with the championship. Wanted to talk a little bit about about roster construction in in general, and specifically the the variety of of different ways that players on last year's roster kind of came to Seattle. You you had the the high major transfers like Cam Tyson, like John Christopoulos, who comes from Creighton. Tyson had come from Houston. I know those guys were both kind of local area guys, but they had tra you know transferred to Seattle. You from those programs, you had junior college additions. You mentioned Shea Riley. Schumacher was a junior college guy as well. You have international freshmen coming in, Kobe Williamson. It, it feels like this roster was built. There, there's not any one way to build a roster in all of college basketball, especially now, but certainly we saw a roster that had a variety of, of guys coming from all different levels at their previous stop to, to end up here at Seattle U. Is that just kind of part of, of the deal in modern college basketball is just having to build the rosters in, in so many different ways? Are there specific things that you have found that, that seem to work successfully in terms of finding players who are ready to contribute to your team right away? Like how, how are you able to balance you know, international recruiting and junior college recruiting and transfer portal and, and domestic recruiting. I mean, first of all, are you ever sleeping? Is any coach sleeping these days with the way that college basketball is set up? But but how does that kind of mix it of, of different ways to, to build talent work for you at Seattle U? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've had to be creative. There's mm -hmm. the recruiting landscape has changed so quickly in the last two or three years. Um, and to stay competitive, you got to be able to adapt and adjust. And for us, we've had we've had success on all fronts. We've we've mm -hmm. been fortunate to have success internationally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've had success transfers from high majors, like you had mentioned, Cam mm -hmm. Tyson coming back home from Houston, Christophilus coming back um, from Creighton, even Brandon Chatfield, who was with us for three years, mm -hmm. was a transfer from Washington State. Right. Yeah. Um, so we found success there. And Alex Schumacher actually came from a Division II school. So. Mm -hmm. And then you throw in the junior college, you know, Darion Trammell, who was with us for two yeah. years, who ended up playing at San Diego State. Mm -hmm. um, Shea Riley, who had great two years. So then we've had some incoming freshmen locally as well. So we've we've done the best we can to scour every option um, and all of our relationships that we've built to try and find a way to get the right talent and, and the right person that fits our university and who we are as a program, too, at the same time. And I'd say the last thing is, as you talk about building a roster, one thing that we've been able to do that's kind of unique to where college basketball is now we've kept guys around for a while mm -hmm. you know cam tyson was here for three years kobe williamson's going on his fifth year mm -hmm. um, we have paris dawson's going on his third year next year we've had guys in this program that have stayed and when you when you're able to keep guys in your program that are the right fit you're able to keep growing and getting better and i think you have a little bit of advantage that way so uh, i think it's both i think it's finding finding the right student athlete that fits who we are as a program and and in our style of basketball fits who we are as a university um, and then keeping them here and then having them stay for multiple years has allowed us to keep growing as a program and, and been, you know, pretty successful the last three seasons. Coach Victor talks about the roster for Seattle U heading into next season and the scheduling challenges that come with being a successful mid-major program to close out the show. All that coming up in just a second. But first, I want to tell you all about today's sponsor, Game Time. Folks, I am stoked 
for the NBA playoffs going on right now. Chet Holmgren and Oklahoma City looking fantastic. And wouldn't it be awesome to be able to go to a game even on a whim? Well, good news. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of the NBA, which makes getting playoff tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to tip off. Plus, with killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets. And if you're somebody who is concerned about buying tickets from another third-party source where they may not be real and you might show up to the game and not have valid tickets, Game Time's ticket coverage it allows your purchase to be covered by the most flexible customer service policy in the entire ticketing industry. And personally, I love having that peace of mind. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app now, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Again, create an account, redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Terms apply. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. Yeah, you know, when you, when you look at even in the WCC, you look at there are some te- some programs that every year seem to be having to rebuild their entire program. They're losing six, seven, eight guys, and and you see some other teams that that maybe you you know obviously Gonzaga and other teams like that are in a, a bit of a different space. But you see teams like Santa Clara's keeping mostly everybody together. Uh, you know, San Francisco seems to be keeping the majority of their group together, and, and it seems to really help to just have that continuity to be able to not have to start over with an entirely new group of persons. And, and to be able to kind of supplement additions uh, as opposed to just having to bring in entirely new starting lineups. And we look at, you know, the, the roster that, that your team has right now going into next season. Obviously, you had some graduations, some guys who are out of eligibility, uh, big time players like Tyson and, and Schumacher. But you also got a couple guys coming in. You got Malik Arrington coming in from Idaho State, Matthew Alexander Moncrief from Georgia coming over from the SEC to come uh, to Seattle to play for the Red Hawks. Like, what can you tell us about these guys coming into the program and how they're going to fit with with a, a group of uh, a consistent amount of returners coming back as well? Yeah, really excited about the, the both guys you mentioned. You know, Malik Arrington um, grew up near Seattle from Auburn, you know, close by and went to Idaho State and had two really good years at Idaho State. Um, and he's a he's a special point guard. He's a extremely competitive. Um, mm-hmm. He's a winner. Um, and he's going to really fit how we play in our style of play. And I'm really excited to have him coming back for two years. Um, and then MA, you know, from coming in from Georgia was an extremely high recruit at a high school to Oklahoma state, mm-hmm. made a big impact at Oklahoma state, um, and had, you know, a good first year at Georgia and his role kind of diminished, you know, and we've had a lot of success with these guys talk about Cam Tyson played at a, for a final four team at Houston, um, mm-hmm. didn't love his role and decided to come back to Seattle. And when we, when we find, that right fit with the right opportunity that we've had. We've had a lot of success with those transfers. So both Malik um, and Moncrief, you know, I'm, I'm, I think you're going to see you're going to see them on the court making a big, big impact for us as well. And then we also got a junior college transfer um, from California to Sean Stevens, who has been a big time scorer his whole career from high school to Juco. He's averaged high 20s his whole career. And um, the way he scores the ball and his versatility at the guard spot, I think will be great. I mean, you can't replace a guy like Cam Tyson. Um, but I think with with some of the guys that we're bringing in, um, we'll we'll be able to create some some new options offensively and and continue to um, to score the ball the way we've been. I wanted to talk about scheduling because this is an area that I think doesn't often get discussed when, when in the national conversation around college basketball of like uh, how difficult it is for coaches to navigate NIL and the transfer portal and all these changes in the sport. But I think that scheduling, particularly for for mid-major programs trying to put together a non-conference schedule is an area that I'm, I'm not sure gets discussed enough for just the challenges and the difficulties. And you want to put together a schedule that's going to to challenge your team and, and build up your resume. But you sometimes it's it's hard to get some of those high major programs in particular to be willing to play programs like Seattle U. Good mid-major programs, I feel like, are kind of at this disadvantage of you know, a high major program doesn't want their, they want to either buy games or they want to play the absolute marquee best of the best. And it kind of leaves those programs, programs in the WCC and programs like Seattle U sort of 
in this spot where I think it's it seems difficult to get some of those marquee games, your, your squad was able has been able to play Washington as a regional game and had a tremendous effort against them last season. A double overtime game was one of the most fun games in college basketball last year. A, a great VCU team was an opportunity as well. But when you are out trying to – you and your staff are out trying to schedule these games and, and get those non-conference opponents, like what are the things you run into, and, and in particular now with – the SEC and the Big Ten and the Big 12 basically just trying to consolidate and build as big of a conference as they possibly can and expanding their conference schedules. That seems like it's going to, I know Mark Few has talked about this, that's going to continue to to squeeze some of these mid-major programs from getting to schedule marquee non-conference games that could impact the MTEs. For you looking at the future of, of college basketball and scheduling, like is that an area of concern of, of how are we going to be able to get some of those uh, those good non-conference games on our schedule and, and kind of how, how, how does that process work for, for your, your, you and your staff? Yeah, great question. Scheduling such a big part of, um, of every college athletic team, especially college basketball. It's, it's a very delicate dance to try and find uh, the right level, the right competition, the right uh, challenges um, and still trying to, to achieve what you want to do as a program. And we've, you know, when we go into our scheduling is we want to continue to grow, continue to challenge ourselves at a high level. Last year, it was travel to VCU, mm-hmm. um, travel to San Francisco and play a really good Don's team yeah. um, on campus. We're, we're fortunate to be able to play Washington every year. So we're able to sprinkle in a few of those. And we have some special ones coming in next year as well. But um, and also try and find games at home in Seattle to be able to play on mm-hmm. campus and be able to play at CPA. So it's trying to get everything done. And it's, it's, it's difficult. but you know, we've, I've always gone into it. So we want to challenge our guys and we want to challenge our program and we want to keep growing. So last year was, let's see, you know, VCU, one of the best mid majors, right? Mm-hmm. Let's go to VCU and see what we can do. And we, the, all the three games that you mentioned were all tough losses for us that we, yeah. that we had a chance to win. You know, we're up beating VCU by nine with two and a half minutes to go. Can't close it out. Played great against San Francisco. Couldn't close it out. Had a chance to beat Washington numerous times on double overtime game. Couldn't close it out. But the work, where we are as a program, we're going to keep scheduling those games and we're going to keep challenging ourselves to see um, to see where we're at and, and to prove not only to us, but to everyone else where this program is and where we're going. Um, we're not afraid to go on the road and play those games in the non-conference. And especially for our fans, who, if we can bring some marquee games back to Seattle and non-conference too and play at home, that's something we want to do. So um, you're right. It's getting harder and harder for us to schedule games. Part of it is kind of the way college basketball is moving. Part of it is when you have some success as a program, it's harder to to get teams to say yes to either to bring you out or, or even to play at home. But um, we're doing our best to, to to keep our schedule challenging in the non-conference, to keep growing as a program, uh, to keep our fans excited about who we bring in home in Seattle. Um, but, yeah, it's, it takes a lot of work. Scheduling is a lot of work behind the scenes to get that done. Coach Chris Victor, thank you so much for coming on the show, uh, giving the, the fans a little bit more information about Seattle U, the excitement of this team coming into the WCC starting in 2025. I think it's going to be a huge boost for the conference. I'm very excited to see how this upcoming season goes for you guys in the WAC, and then, of course, uh, what what things look like as you guys get into the WCC the following year. Thanks again for, for taking the time to hop on the show. I know things are, are always busy in the current college basketball landscape, so I appreciate you uh, making the time to make this work. Got it, Andy. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. It's going to wrap it up for us today here on the Locked On Zags podcast. A big thank you again to Coach Chris Victor for taking the time to come on the show, help teach us all a little bit more about the Seattle U Red Hawks. Looking forward to those upcoming matchups in 2025. We're going to have another guest lined up for Thursday's show as well here on Locked On Zags. We'll, of course, keep you up to date on what's going on at the NBA Draft Combine with Michael Ajayi. We'll keep you up to date on any transfer portal rumors as we see them. WNBA season's getting started. We got all sorts of fantastic stuff coming your way on the Locked On Zags podcast. So stick with us. Appreciate all of you who are everyday listeners. You know who you are. Big shout out to all of you. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, as always, go Zags.